exciting technology that was just approved in July. Uh, initially brought to the United States by Orthospace, purchased by Stryker, uh, and now commercialized. So I'm just going to give you a little high, high level overview of the technology, the study, uh, a sample case, and then we'll open up for questions. And then there's an opportunity to uh, perform the procedure on these uh, uh, models. And it, it is actually part of the, to be able to use this, you do have to do that. Um, so it is part of the certification process. I, I had to do it as well, so everyone has to do it. So obviously we know rotator cuff tears are extremely common, and I use this video all the time. You know, we have this constant steady state, the teeter-totter, and then we have this happen, boom, massive cuff tear. Those are usually fairly reparable, but then you have this sort of chronically adapted uh, well-functioning uh, large tear. We don't know why, but that exists a lot. People, people are oftentimes asymptomatic. They die with it, and we only discover it when we do our um, cadaveric dissections for education, etc. But then you have this, you know, the elephant on your shoulder. It won't move. Um, maybe it'll get to 90, 100 degrees, but it won't get fully overhead or you're having pain, and you try to rebalance it. And there's lots of technology out there, and I think Again, this is not a hammer and nail situation. This is a technology for you to consider using in certain situations. And I think that's important to remember. Stryker really wants people to be responsible in the use of new technology. This is not balloonomania, okay? This is not the reverse mania of 10 years ago. This is using the balloon for the right indication for your patient when necessary, okay? And that's important to remember. Um, <clears throat> so with every procedure, I think we want something that's potentially permanent, if it has to be converted, it can be converted easily. It's easy to put in and easy to remove. And probably for orthopedic surgeons, I would say, paid well. Just kidding. That's a joke. All right. Um, we know from this paper, it's been shown a bazillion times. You fix a cuff, uh, massive tear, often fails, but the patients do get better, right? There's this, there's this, it's not an all or none phenomenon. There is this dimmer effect that when you fix a cuff, Symptomatically, they may improve. Quality of life may improve. Their power may not be as good as it should be. Their ASES score may not be as good as it should be. But their overall satisfaction is not bad. Um, and so this in-space balloon spacer came out. And I think the backstory to this is so cool that I want to share it with you. The backstory to this is this guy's a genius. I can't say that because this is being recorded. Um, it, he's a genius. So this guy's a hip and knee surgeon, okay? We all thought hip and knee surgeons were idiots, right? Oh, hip and knee surgeons. Look, they do two operations. You have arthritis, you need a total knee. This guy is an entrepreneur. So this guy said, <clears throat> well, he was a serial entrepreneur, and they had him on a urology company, okay? That's the prostate, I think. And they were using this balloon to dilate the ureter so people could urinate. That's what I think. And he comes up to the board and says, I think we can apply this technology somewhere else. And they're like, oh, that's cool, where, where? He's like, maybe the shoulder. And they're like, yeah, stupid idea, don't do it. So what does he do? Dave. He does it. He goes to Slovenia, right? Slovenia, IRB, non-existent, <laughs> Slovenia. Does like 20, comes back and tells the board, success, it was awesome. You know what they said? You're fired. They fired him. The chairman of the board, though, thought it was an amazing idea. He said, hey, listen, I know you got fired, but I'd like to invest a little bit of money in this startup with you, and then get the Americans to fund it. This is the Israeli surgeon. And so some Israelis put some money in it, and all of a sudden, he started doing it. <clears throat> and got it started up. First time I ever saw it, I was in Reading, England, I want to say probably about 2012. And he was an exhibitor at a meeting like this, one of the lower tier exhibitors. He was like in a closet. And uh, he's like, uh, show me this balloon. And I'm looking at him, and he's showing me these patients going like this, every one of them. And I'm like, okay, dude, whatever. And then I'm like, there's no way a balloon will ever get approved in the United States. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, it takes us 20 years to get something approved. Well, sure enough, five years later, he's in our, <coughs> our um, conference room at Rothman trying to recruit us to see if we'd be involved in the IDE, FDA IDE. And the rest is, is history. Venture capital, com companies bid for it, and next thing you know, now Stryker owns it. One product, 
$220 million they paid for it. One product, not a whole company, one product. Um, commercial experience in Europe, 30,000 and growing. Um, <clears throat> the IDE, for any of you who have been involved in IDE, it's basically like the IRS living at your house, okay? So when you're doing an IDE, it's very stringent, very strict, and it should be. You know, it's potentially changing the care of our patients in the future, introducing new technology. We've got to make sure it's safe for our patients. This was a study that started about six years ago, um, and we were involved in it from the beginning. And <clears throat> I had the pleasure of enrolling the last patient, which meant they were waiting for my last patient follow-up to make sure they could submit to the FDA. And so this was a randomized, prospective, single-blinded, multi-center study. So in orthopedics, that's pretty rare. And it was an easy enrollment because I'll tell you, patients know rotator cuff surgery is a bitch, okay? Or a bastard, or whatever you want to call it, okay? But it hurts a ton, okay? No one wants to get a massive rotator cuff repair, but they know sometimes they need it and they'll go through with it. But when these patients came in and they were told they have a massive rotator cuff tear, high likelihood of failure with an attempted repair, but we could potentially enroll them in the study. To my surprise, patients were very quickly enrolling in the study and, and optimistic that hopefully they would be randomized into the balloon, okay? And so <clears throat> these patients were randomized intra-op after we verified some key things. First of all, pre-op, the patients had to meet certain criteria. They had to have minimal OA on MRI. Um, <clears throat> they had to have at least 90 degrees of forward elevation. They had to have an uh, intact subscap, intact teres minor, okay? And <clears throat> intra-op, we had to do the same assessment. We had to verify that those things were intact. The biceps didn't matter, the labrum didn't matter. Uh, you didn't do anything to the labrum. You, you could do whatever you wanted to do to the biceps. You, you were either randomized to repairing whatever you could or a balloon. There was no partial repair in a balloon. It was one or the other, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so multiple sites, these are all the surgical sites and surgeons that were involved in the study um, <clears throat> from North America, uh, Canada, USA. This is a biodegradable balloon. So it's important to remember, this balloon does dissolve over six to 12 months. It does not stay permanently. So the common question I always get is, well, if it doesn't stay permanently, how do you maintain the benefit? Well, go back to that teeter-totter where the balloon's bouncing back and forth. If you create a <clears throat> chronically compensated rotator cuff issue, patients actually do fairly well for a period of time. How long that is? Five, six, seven years. Will they eventually decompensate? Possibly. Most likely, probably. But that's a long time, five, six, seven years. Okay? Um, this is a study design. I'm not going to tell you all the details, but I already mentioned prospective, single-blinded, multi-center, randomized control, over 40, uh, massive irreparable tough tears. They were seen rigorously. They were MRI'd at uh, one year. Uh, the other time point was six. Um, <clears throat> they had standardized rehab and two-year follow-up. Um, patients generally uh, that were included mentioned all this, I think, uh, so they couldn't have a subscap tear. You know, these patients should not have significant proximal migration. So greater than a hamada three, these are not candidates, for this, okay? Um, <clears throat> we collected tons of PROs. I'm not going to go through all that data. 88% sub subject retention. I mean, these patients got certified letters. They were, I mean, they were, if they weren't coming back, they were getting hounded to come back. So we're, I mean, you know, and 184, 184, the right number? 184 patients was our total end, I'm sorry, total end was 162, 83 in the end space, 79 in the partial repair, average age 66. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see here, this is comparing in space and partial repair or full repair as much as you could. Significant improvements in both groups in their uh, various outcome measures, including the ASES. You can see forward elevation, statistically significant, was at day 10, week 6, month 12, and month 24. The, the in-space did outperform the partial repair. Uh, the Western Ontario rotator cuff uh, score was significantly improved in both groups, as was VAS, quality of life, 
etc. No device related adverse events. Okay, so one of the things that I think, <clears throat> and I've talked about this for a long time, about five five years now about this technology, and I want to be very clear to you. I think the same thing Jerry said earlier today in one of his talks is, is very important. The one thing that you never want to compromise is your integrity as a surgeon. And I can tell you that whether I'm a paid speaker, which I am today, or not a paid speaker, I believe in this technology. And I put my put forward believing in this technology. So I'm not sitting here telling you something that I think is so-so. This is the real deal. In my ex experience, in the last 15 years, I think this is the greatest technological advancement in shoulder surgery that I've seen. Okay? And, you know, I'm excited that it's out. We had a couple patients that failed in the study out of, out of those 160 some patients that one had a one had a scope in each group and one was and one was converted to a reverse or two were converted to a reverse. One was mine uh, in each group. Um, advantages, accelerated rehab. In the study, we did have them follow the same rehab protocol. So if patients got a repair or a balloon, they follow the same rehab protocol. So basically, they're in a sling four to six weeks, then started passive and active range of motion, et cetera. In reality, though, if I'm doing a balloon, an isolated balloon at this point, I would do accelerated rehab. So do we know what the perfect rehab for it is? No, we don't. But my sense is, after a few weeks of letting the tissue trauma kind of settle down, I would start them in rehab. And currently, I've done three since the FDA approval. And um, my approach has been about 10 days, let things quiet down, and then start phase one, phase two exercises as far as range of motion. And then probably in four to six weeks, I'll start strengthening. Um, <clears throat> operative time, significantly uh, less in the study, 44 to 71 minutes. And you may say, why did it take 44 minutes? Part of it actually was the randomization process. We had to verify everything, and then it took a little while to randomize them. If you're doing this, and, and you know, all of you here are experienced arthroscopists, and you're doing an isolated balloon, it's at most a 10-minute operation. You know, now if you're going to add to it a bicep skinnedesis or a partial cuff repair, that's different. Um, so it's a, I think, a potential option in your armamentarium when you're thinking about massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. They have to meet appropriate criteria. Um, I think, like I said in the beginning, everyone wants this to be used responsibly and appropriately. I think some of the anecdotal stories that you hear from Europe are for people that are using it for the wrong indication. Pseudoparalysis, cuff tear involving subscap maybe teres, bad arthritis. Yes, I mean, I think if you do that, anything in the wrong, in the wrong patient, it's not gonna be a good thing. Um, so I'm gonna show you, this is the first patient I ever did. This, this gentleman, I'm gonna say his name, is Edward Fisher, 63, Mason. And I've shown this case several times. He tried non-operative. He had pretty good passive range of motion, forward elevation was to 90. And you can see his, his studies are pretty ideal for this type of problem. You can see on his MRI, on his sagittals, significant atrophy. Uh, this, in, I think most people's hands, is a irreparable rotator cuff tear. You can consider other options. Um, subscaps intact, did not seem to have much arthritis. Um, this is typically done through two portals. Simple bursectomy, leave that medial, medium, the median veil of tissue between the glenoid um, and the clavicle, et cetera, leave that alone. Because the balloon is not stationary in position. I'll show you a dynamic video in a second. So if you put a balloon in the subacromial space and you do a wide bursectomy immediately, the balloon is going to tend to want to migrate where there's the least amount of pressure, or the most amount of pressure forcing it to the area of least resistance, right? So it's going to go in the supraspinatus fossa, just natural. It doesn't do that if you leave that tissue alone. Okay, so I think it's really important you leave that tissue alone on the medial side. Um, measure your, your defect. There's three sizes, small, medium, large, appropriate amount of volume that you put into it. Um, and then if you're going to do anything before you insert the balloon, do that first, then insert the balloon. Uh, I, I would not recommend trying to do any ancillary procedure after inserting the balloon. Uh, then, case, obviously. This is that same gentleman. Uh, so that's 
Cartilage looks good. That's the subscap in the middle. And then that's the lateral view. You can see retracted to the edge, chain suture. This is the, this is the insertion. So um, you'll see here when you, when you try it, it comes with a sheath, basically like its own little cannula. Then <clears throat> you put it in as uh, appropriately after you've sized it, withdraw it. Then you unfurl the balloon, so you overinflate it initially. Then you withdraw some fluid from it. And it has like a champagne cork mechanism to seal the back of the balloon. So that after you've, you've filled it, it does not uh, extrude any fluid. Now you can see here, I didn't do much. I went in there, put the balloon in, left the biceps alone. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, the pendulum seems to be swinging towards, hey, let's save the biceps. We might need it for something. I think it's going to be used for like, I don't know, spinal cord issues in the future. I, everyone's like using it for something different now. Auden tells me he's using it for instability now. Transferring the biceps. Split the subscap, put it there for, so anyway, I, I'm not a biceps killer, in general. And you can see the chromohumeral interval increases. This is Anand's picture, this is Anand's x-ray. Uh, he likes to make sure I, I note that every time I use it. And you can see how much the interval increased. Now, this gradually decreases over time, which is natural because the balloon is, uh, like I said, is resorbed over time. And you can see what I was talking about. The balloon is dynamic, okay? It's not a static, it's not static. And this is probably why SCR, when it fails on the glenoid side, works. If you have something on the tuberosity, it's buffering that area between the tuberosity and your chromium, right? And so this thing's a dynamic structure, and because it's a balloon, you'll feel it. Its coefficient of friction is probably very good, so it slides back and forth. It's like a, it's like a hard jellyfish in your subacromial space moving around. And can you raise your arms up in front of you? In front of you? Sorry. Good. Back down. Great. Out to the side like you're flying like a bird. So, I was going away. This is my first guy. I was like, this Good. is Put your arms at your side you know, like this. Most patients have your elbow like this. They get yep. in their arm, Rotate out. Move. And that's, both arms at the same time. Oh. Side, the right this side. You can see don't care too much. Like Good. And relax. <laughs> Good. And turn your back to me, please. And then what I want you to do is, so sure I showed you this before, reach behind your back, up your back. Good. And the other arm. Right, and this that's Philly's it. Thank post you. Up. And I have videos of him at so one year. So we're now one year out see, from the balloon. Weight, Arthroplasty, but, you know, right? Yeah. He's okay. still maintaining. And, I have two years uh, out on Let me see you him. raise your arms up. And he's going to be very similar Good. to motion. Back down. Out to the so side. The ponytail. Back you down. Okay. And then, do you play this audio file? This is yesterday. Okay? Now he's six years out. Called me yesterday. Can you play the audio? Can you click on that file? Uh, Dr. Bo, this is Edward Fisher. I was wondering about the operation that you did on my shoulder five years ago. If it became good now, my number is 0405. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a, Thank you, know, you. I know it's an N of one, it's anecdotal, but it's pretty interesting. Like, he's finding me, okay? I, I'm sure he doesn't exactly, you know, keep a Rolodex of all his contacts, but he, he knows where I am, he knows how to reach me, he calls my cell phone, leaves me a voicemail. Because Technology clearly was, in his mind, beneficial to him. So it's, it's, for me, it's a very powerful sort of little story. So, you know, where is this in my armamentarium? I mean, I, I think if you're young, I think, you know, SCR, I, I, I personally don't do SCR, but I know a lot of surgeons do, and I think it works well in a lot of people's hands. I just honestly don't have the patience for it. I, I just, and I'm not really sure at the end of the day that makes that big a difference for me to use all that time and resource for what I may or may not gain. Not trying to disparage a, a technology. So for me, if it's younger uh, and it's truly irreparable, balloons coming into my equation, they're older physiologically, RSA. Um, if their pre-op functional level is low, it's going to be an RSA. High, again, SCR balloon, as long as they're not necessarily uh, severely arthritic. Same thing on this side. Severely arthritic, they're getting an RSA. Minimal, even if they're older, uh, they're potentially getting a balloon and risk stratification. Now, I think when you talk to people about this, I think some industry individuals and surgeons worry that is this going to cannibalize my my reverse shoulder arthroplasty population? Or no, this should be a distinct population. This should be the population that you're doing other procedures on that you're still trying to figure out, like we were having that debate at the end of the day, the 50-year-old with the massive tear, what do you do with them? SCR, lower trap, do you, you know, 
smooth and move. What do, you, what do you do for that patient, right? That's where this is coming in. If you're doing reverses on those patients, I, I think, I, 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 in my opinion, I think that's really pushing the envelope a little too far for those patients as far as reverse goes. Um, so I think this is also that patient that comes in at 78 that's getting cortisone steroids all the time and wants nothing to do with any s significant surgery but doesn't want to live like this if they can avoid it and they can have a procedure with minimal morbidity. Every operation is an operation, but I could see myself doing this operation with just a, just a block, a regional. I mean, this is not necessarily a GA operation. If I know what I'm doing going into there, they don't necessarily have to get GA uh, for, for this operation. They go out, same day, sling a couple days, they should be able to get back to their life. When you think about the stress an operation puts on a 70-some-year-old patient as far as having people around to assist them, not being able to drive, losing independence, you know, ADLs, all those things, I think, in my experience, they seem to be faster when you utilize the balloon in the right patient. And I think a lot of these patients are patients that are very averse to anything surgical, but honestly, they can't live on just cortisone shots and just sort of sucking it up the next literally 10 to 20 years. People are living well into their 80s and 90s. So, um, obviously, I think it's a safe procedure. There's increasing biomechanical data, looking at uh, how it works, decreased OR time, technically simple, fast return to function. Um, so I think it's fairly safe, it's straightforward, and doesn't burn any, any potential bridges for you in most cases. Um, so that's all I had to say. I'm happy to take questions, and then um, Stryker does have samples here for you to do it, sign off, get the authorization, sort of uh, potentially consider uh, being able to use it in your practice. But, I mean, I, I think it's still an operation. It may not work. Um, and, but other than that, I, I can't, I mean, you know, every operation has a risk of infection. Biodegradable, it goes away. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, why isn't it permanent? And, you know, somebody else gave me, a, a, not, well, this is not my answer, but I thought it was a pretty smart answer. If something can do a job effectively and d disappear, isn't that better than staying in your body? I thought that was pretty interesting. Because my bias always was, why wouldn't this be a permanent structure or material? Because eventually you would possibly migrate again. I haven't had a second look on any of these patients, so I don't know what forms in that space. But I imagine it's probably some fibrous reactive tissue. Yep. So for the study, the implant was obviously free. So if you repaired it, you coded a repair. And if you did the balloon, you coded a debridement. So Currently, there is no carve out for the balloon. So it's part of your DRG of whatever you get reimbursed for that procedure. So if you do a debridement, you get a debridement reimbursement, do a cuff repair with it, you get a cuff repair reimbursement, do a biceps knees, et cetera, okay? Um, I think we should be very clear. The price point is pretty significant, and that's for several reasons. One is they pay $220 million for this technology. Two, um, Stryker really wants people to pause before using it, not just slam it into everybody because it's at a price point where, you know, you can put it in for anything. Um, and it's the sticker price, okay, just like a car. So I think that everyone's going to get a price that's going to be a little bit variable from the other place based on, obviously, Stryker's a big company and what your contracts are with your ASC or hospital and how it works out. My understanding... Uh, is that because of the strength of the study, randomized, prospective, blinded study, IDE, that once they collect enough data this year, they'll be able to submit a code for a carve-out. So this will be reimbursed in addition to whatever sort of your, your billing. So like I said, the, the cost is not a, I don't think it's an easy issue for people to kind of solve that quickly right now. And I'm sure you've had chat with people about the price point. The national price point is $6,500 for it. So I, I consult for them. I didn't have anything to do with designing this. I get no royalties, so I'm just being very clear. But that's the price point. Do I think it's high? Yes, I do. Do I think it's, it's fair given all the, the variables involved? I think the, the, the situation is appropriate at this time. It will change. Okay, But I think at this point, that's the price point. 
So I, you know, I try to be as direct about that as possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, and again, I mean, you know, obviously, in talking about this with Stryker, that was one of their approaches. Like, we really don't want a lot of people putting this in, having some nightmare situations, and then all of a sudden getting bad press for being really bad technology. They really want people who are really thoughtful about how they're going to use this. So for me, um, I've started having the conversation with patients that if they want this, they're going to have to pay for the implant separately at this point because my ASC is giving me a little pushback about the price point for it. But, I mean, I, I'm sure you also have patients that, and I'm not saying the same type of thing, but they're paying $1,000 for a PRP injection. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's a good idea, but people do it. I'm not saying we should take advantage of that, but I'm just saying that's the way I'm handling it at this point. Yeah, so the first 20 or so that were done had to have ultrasounds at, uh, I believe it was 10 or 12 days, and I actually had to get trained by a radiologist to bring in an ultrasound machine and verify and validate it. The FDA wanted to review all that. I had no balloon dislodgement in my patients, and I don't believe the study had any balloon dislodgement. Okay? But I think it's very important, as I was saying, when you go in and these patients have these massive tears and they develop this reactive bursa immediately, do not mess with that bursa. Because otherwise, when you do put the balloon in there, as you saw in that video, the balloon goes lateral. But if you open up that space medial, it'll want to go medial. Now, the downside of that is, yeah, I don't know if you want a balloon in your supraspinatus fossa, but truly the downside of that is pretty minimal. It's not like going to migrate somewhere else. And yes, you can stick a needle, pop it, or go in and retrieve it. Um, but it is biodegradable. Too. So um, Initially, they, they, some have said they feel tight and full <clears throat> in their shoulder. I, I think that probably makes sense. Um, so my level five data would say yes, but I don't have any science to truly really support that. I know LaFosse has had a lot of experience with that, uh, but I'm not aware if he's published on that or not. So as opposed to like arthroplasty where you undersize or revise, my experience has been go up. So if you're between sizes, go up. And that's, I, I, honestly, I learned that from Asif. The, the guy who invented it. He said, you know, if you're between sizes, go with the bigger one. So the one gentleman that went on to a reverse, um, he just never took off. Like, he had it, never felt like he was feeling that great, never really got going, and eight months into it, kind of just disappeared, saw another surgeon and had a reverse. Um, yeah, it was, it, it's not, they sink and swim pretty, pretty quickly, you know, as soon as they can. Because I think the best thing you can do is re-educate the muscle, right? Putting tension on the deltoid, the pec, lat, remaining cuff. So if they can do it, they should do it. I'm not. I mean, obviously, if there's some major chromial hook or something, maybe. But I, I never did. Yeah, I guess theoretically that's possible. I didn't come across it. But again, you know, um, we're talking about hundreds of patients, not thousands. Sure, and as experience increases, there'll be situations. So, I mean, if, if it was an acute, if it was a recent operation, I'd be a little concerned if their CA ligament was, was taken down and hadn't fibrosed back down, uh, that it could migrate kind of anteriorly. But if it was a while ago, um, I think it's less than ideal. Uh, I, I, but... I would say 50% of my patients that got a balloon were, were, were revision. So um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if we know well enough if those revision patients will have a more difficult problem or difficult recovery. I, I don't think they cross over, honestly, in my practice. They really don't cross over. The reverse patient is still a reverse patient. This is a patient that I would have been like, Gonna have a tough cuff repair. Try it. May or may not work. I can do it. We can, there's this other option. You know, you may end up in the same place, two different pathways, right? Which is kind of what the study showed. A little bit better with in space, but they still kind of, in a lot of ways, ended up at the same place. Um, so, it, it's. I mean, obviously, it, you know, any any technology you got to explain to the patient. Um, but you know, with 
rotator cuff repairs being what they are and people understanding how much they hurt, a lot of them are willing to listen to other technologies out there and their role and the pros and cons of it. You know, we're you know, pretty sophisticated. They do a lot of research in space. They're on the internet. They're, they're searching. I mean, they all watch your cuff repairs. They know what you're doing in there. Single row, double. They're asking all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm sure it's a matter of time before they start asking about this. I mean, people ask me about and in transfers, SCR all the time. I mean, I think... <clears throat> You know, those things always potentially can help. They're clearly a pain in our ass, to be honest, as a provider. Um, you know, some insurance companies are much more reasonable. They understand some of the um, <coughs> differential costing, right? You just kind of line item costing, sure, it's a, it's a big line item, right? But <coughs> if you're really doing differential costing, and let's say the other option is reverse or an SCR, um, depending on the patient's age, skilled nursing, level of PT, time down, overall cost of society. I mean, a lot of other costs, obviously, with every procedure that we do, right? And you, know, you look at that and you go, I mean, if we're really <coughs> bundle payment, we bundle all this together, it kind of starts making a little bit more sense, right? I'm not trying to defend Stryker or the price point for it, but I'm just saying, like, if you look at the whole bundle of what a cuff repair costs, or an SCR cost versus a balloon, the societal impact, I don't know. I really don't know. It's an interesting study. Someone like Alex is going to study because he's an MBA. So he's going he's to do the whole costing for us. <laughs>